While he is in Galilee, his fame is spreading, and it says that people came from all over Galilee and the Decapolis and Jerusalem and Judea and beyond the Jordan. This sets the scene for what we're reading in the, uh, in the Sermon on the Mount. It's these crowds that are being mentioned in chapter 5 of Matthew in verse 1 when it says, Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught. The Sermon on the Mount begins with the beautiful Beatitudes. The work of Jesus was proclaiming the kingdom. It was his message that God's kingdom is coming into the world. That doesn't mean a place or a human government, but that means God will be ruling his people again, something that the Jewish people have been looking forward to after centuries and centuries of domination by foreign powers. They were looking forward to the day when they again would be under God's rule and be God's people. Jesus, in claiming to bring in God's kingdom, is making a messianic claim. And as we look at the Beatitudes, I want you to look at them in addition to their individual meanings as a, a statement that Jesus is bringing about the wonderful change that everybody has been looking for. No longer are God's people the ones that are left out and, and uh oppressed and ruled by foreigners, but now there'll be great spiritual blessings coming to God's true people. So one by one, we'll look at the uh, Beatitudes, and you need to be taking notes so that you'll be able to recognize any of them, should you be asked about them on a test. First of all, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Those who are poor in spirit have broken spirits. They're not proud. They're not self-important. They're not self-righteous. The attitude that is reflected in Psalm 34, verse 18, The Lord is near the brokenhearted, and he saves the crushed in spirit. Or in the penitential Psalm of David, Psalm 51, in verse 17, he says, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. In both of these psalms, the attitude is that those who are open to being blessed by God are those who realize their frailty, their faults, their sins. Their spirits have been broken, and they know that God should be the one ruling in their lives. And so it is in that sense that Jesus says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Yes, it is promising heaven, but much more than that, it's promising that God can rule in their lives once they break out of the arrogant, human, self-important, self-righteous pride. When he says, blessed are those who mourn because they'll be comforted, he is echoing the messianic prophecy of Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 61. You'll recognize this as the passage that Jesus read in the Nazareth synagogue when people were impressed with his words before they turned on him and tried to get rid of him. In Isaiah, 
It reads this way, chapter 61, verses 1 through 3. Listen to the message of delivery, the, the message of relief, for God's rule returning to his people. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant to those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes. The wonderful promise is that those who are mourning because God's city is not under God's rule, these people are finally to be blessed. They're no longer to be dressed in the clothes of someone who is mourning uh, like they've lost a loved one. They can put on fine clothes again. They'll be comforted now that Jesus is bringing in the kingdom of heaven. And that's what he's proclaiming, the kingdom of heaven, the rule of God over his people. Those who mourn will be comforted. Similar to the poor in spirit, Jesus pronounces a blessing on those who are meek and says, interestingly, that they will inherit the earth. Meekness is not the same as weakness. Meekness is more the restraint that a powerful person shows. Moses is said to have been the meekest man in the world. Jesus is described as meek, and yet both were empowered by God in mighty ways, but in their manner. In their control, they were meek. What is this blessing that they inherit the earth? Well, think of the Lord's Prayer. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. That's one line echoing the other. Your kingdom come means the same thing as your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It is a prayer for the rule of God to be as surely accepted on earth as it is in heaven. It is a prayer for the work of Jesus to become real in people's lives, for God to be their ruler. Listen to how Psalm 37 expresses this thought of the meek inheriting. In just a little while, the wicked will be no more. Though you look carefully at his place, he will not be there. But the meek shall inherit the land and delight themselves in abundant peace. The messianic hope and promise is that those who have been restrained, who have not pushed their way through the world, they are the ones who will be able to enjoy the blessings on this earth the blessings that come when people on this earth are subject to the rule of God, when they are truly subjects of his kingdom. Augustine wrote, You who wish to possess the earth now, take care. If you are meek, you will possess it. But if ruthless, the world will possess you. Most people who want to be king of the world are anything but meek. They are assertive beyond measure. They are aggressive. They are power seekers. And Augustine would remind them to remember the words of Jesus about the meek inheriting the earth. If you don't take a meek approach, then that dog-eat-dog -dog world will take you over. Next, Jesus pronounces a blessing on those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. On one level, certainly he's saying, if righteousness is so important to you that you're never satisfied, you never feel full until you grasp hold of righteousness, that is one level of what he's talking about. There's certainly a great concern for being right with God. You'll see there I list some concerns in the fifth chapter and the sixth chapter of Matthew. But there's also a concern for justice in this world. There's a concern that the justice system be fair to all. 
there is a concern that people not neglect the needy. And in a sense, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness are those who look at this world and its power structures and decide that it's not righteous. It's not what it should be. Justice does not rule the earth. And so these people hunger and thirst for righteousness. And they are told, to the extent that God is king, to the extent that heaven rules on this earth, to that extent you can be satisfied. Your hunger and your thirst for righteousness can be satisfied. The next group of Beatitudes are not necessarily about people hurting, at least the next three are not. One is a saying that makes so much sense on the surface, but it is deeper than some realize. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Mercy is not necessarily pardon. Mercy is not pity. Mercy is giving good when someone deserves to receive bad. Mercy is what you want if you have committed some offense that deserves a serious punishment, but you hope the judge will have mercy on you and give you another chance. The emphasis on they shall receive mercy that certainly has an application in life. It is true that merciful people will probably get mercy back if they show mercy to the person that they offend. But surely the lesson is about eternal judgment. That if you want God's mercy, and all of us must have God's mercy on that final day of judgment, then you need to be showing mercy to the people around you. You can't just give people what they deserve. You're to be merciful. If you're to be like God, you're to be merciful to others. If you want God to be merciful to you. One of the most beautiful of the Beatitudes is the next one. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. A person who is pure in heart is someone in whom there is no pretense, What's inside is expressed outside, and there are no evil motives, no sinful attitudes. A person who is pure in heart is one whose inner person has been cleansed of the contamination of sin. And there we run into a roadblock. Because we're all guilty. And we all know that we're unworthy to stand in God's holy presence. The only people who can be pure in heart are those who are assured that their hearts have been made pure through the sacrifice of Jesus. And if you can believe in that forgiveness, and if you can see yourself as God sees his forgiven people, then you can see God. Yes, in the sense you can go to heaven and see God, but you will perceive God better to the extent that your heart is made pure through the forgiveness that comes to those who are devoted to Jesus. The last of the regular, I'll explain in a minute, the regular Beatitudes is the peacemakers. They're going to be called children of God. Notice that it's peacemakers, not just peaceful people, not just peaceable people, but people who will enter into a conflict to make peace. Perhaps a conflict between self and another. Perhaps a conflict between two others. To be children of God, to be godlike, is to be a peacemaker. To be one who is all about reconciling people who have been alienated. That's what God's work in Jesus is all about. Reconciling us to him after we have been alienated from him. And so to the extent that we have God's rule in our lives, to that extent we'll use every opportunity we have to make peace with those who may be at odds with us and to help people to make peace with one another and most of all for people to make peace with God. If we can do that, then we can be called children of God. 
The last one I say is somewhat different because it's not just a simple and beautiful statement, but there's more of an explanation to it. There is a blessing to those who are persecuted for righteousness. Those who are persecuted for the for their loyalty to what is righteous, for their loyalty to Christ. If there are people who slander you and persecute you because you belong to Christ, then there's a blessing pronounced upon you. It is the same one as the blessing that we started reading about, and that is, yours is the kingdom of heaven. Luke gives an account of a sermon, which may very well be another account of this same sermon, with Luke recording parts that Matthew did not and vice versa. It could be a separate, similar sermon on a similar occasion. But much of the content is the same with some important differences. Luke's account of this sermon is in chapter 6. In Luke chapter 6, the blessings are for hurting people in a more here in this world sort of hurt. His Beatitudes, or his record of, of Beatitudes that Jesus gave, this time Jesus is talking about just the poor, not the poor in spirit, meaning people who don't have enough funds to make it through, the poor. The Beatitudes that Jesus expresses in the sermon that Luke records are not so much those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. It's about people who are hungry now. They don't have enough to eat. It's not about people who mourn for Zion, who mourn in their deep spirit in relation to God. It's about people who are crying now. And look, that's a beautiful blessing. The poor get to be in God's kingdom. The hungry can look forward to being satisfied. Those who cry are going to have a time to laugh. In a way, Jesus is just talking about how things are going to be different now. As I announce to you the coming of the kingdom, all things are going to be different. One important difference in the sermon as recorded by Luke and the one by Matthew is that Luke includes the flip side of the blessings. He includes the woes upon the people who aren't right with God. But look how he classifies those people. When he says, woe to you, or I feel sorry for you, he's talking about comfortable people. Those who are rich and well-fed and laughing and popular. Something I guess we all want to be. But the message is that if you are comfortable in all these ways, you're probably not seeking the rule of God in your life because why would you change if you're comfortable? He says to the rich, you, you're so comfortable, you got what you aimed for, you're not going to get the eternal reward. He says to those who are well fed, you know the day is going to come when you're going to be gnawing in a different kind of hunger. There's going to be a day when you're not laughing like you are now. You'll be mourning and weeping. You're so proud that everybody praises you. Remember, everybody praises the false prophet. Woe to you. About our place in the world as believers, we are to be salt and light. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You're the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Salt of the earth. Salt is so common to us. Salt at certain times in history was extremely valuable. I understand it was even currency. Salt to us, you can buy a box for under a dollar and who knows what year you'll have to buy another box of salt. But salt was valuable. Salt had all kinds of good properties to it. One of which is 
but it tastes better with salt on it. Salt also has, you know, its preservative qualities, and whatever the qualities of salt are, whatever make it so valuable, when it loses its saltiness, what good is it? I guess if you leave salt just laying out to the elements long enough, it'll just be grit. But what do you do with something that's nothing but some grit? Well, it's useless. You throw it out. Maybe maybe there's ice on the ground and you, you throw it out to, to increase the traction or, or there's a, a muddy patch in the yard and you, you just throw this gritty old what used to be salt out. And it's not worth anything except for people to walk on top of it. Of course, he said, you are the salt of the earth. We use the phrase to mean that's a good person. He's salt of the earth. But here he's talking about you have a usefulness in this world. And if you're not fulfilling your purpose, then you are useless. If you're not salty. Now he doesn't define salty so well, but it's so clearly connected to light of the world that we can understand what he is talking about. He tells us what it is to be the light of the world. Your mission is to enable the world to see the Father. You should be as clearly seen as a city on a hill. At night, the lights of that city shine unhindered by any tree or structure or anything else. The city is plain to be seen. It's up on a hill, so let your light shine. That's a command. You're to take responsibility and do something with it. Let your light shine. So what is shining your light? It's your good deeds. But with a certain caution that's going to come up in the sixth chapter. The goal is that people will see your good deeds and they will glorify the Father. The warning in chapter 6 is that you do not do good deeds in order to draw attention to yourself and make people think you're good. You do good deeds so that people will see the good that's being done in the world. And that will turn them to the goodness of God. To the salt of the earth, to the light of the world, don't become useful. Draw attention to God by your Jesus is speaking to people about how he fulfills the law, the law being the law of Moses. Jesus is, of course, talking to people who are of largely Jewish background. And he is telling them that he didn't come to abolish the law. Beginning in chapter 5, verse 17, do not think that I've come to abolish the the law, or the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. The King James Version uses the words jot and tittle, where this one says not one iota, not a dot. In the illustration on the upper right, you see an ancient manuscript of the Bible. And you see that small letter that is circled is an iota. Uh, or, down at the bottom, a Hebrew letter, a yod, which would correspond to that. You'll notice they're both, like our letter I, very small, uh, just a stroke. Uh, the titles you can see up in the... Uh, upper illustration, there are little marks above it, uh, those are tittles. In um, our own alphabet, you see the I and the J, each of them has a tittle, a mark above it. Jesus says not one of these little marks, not one little letter I is going to be dropped from God's law. God's law will abide. Then he goes on to say, in verse 19, therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do so, the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness 
exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Notice that he is still over and over emphasizing the kingdom of heaven. The Gospels tell us that what Jesus did was he went about preaching the kingdom and that the kingdom was, was coming, the kingdom is arriving. He is talking about his role as the Messiah, bringing the rule of God to be effective in this world. And he's telling them that God's law, which we would call the Old Testament, will continue to always have its important place. And that those who will teach it are great in God's kingdom. He's going to be focusing on the heart. That thought seems to begin in verse 20. Unless your righteousness exceeds these people, then you're not going to be in the kingdom of heaven. So he's going to be focusing on the heart, and he uses two groups prominent in their Jewish society, the scribes and the Pharisees. The scribes were the experts who would write out the law, and as such, they would know what the law said, and they're usually presented in a negative light in the New Testament. The Pharisees were one of the leading groups of Jews, uh, particularly in Jerusalem. They carried great weight, not that everyone signed up to be a Pharisee, but the Pharisees were highly influential. Uh, to briefly identify them, we could say that they were advocates of holiness, but they defined holiness strongly in terms of not accepting Western, that is, Greek, Hellenic ways. That was maintaining their Jewishness. Their attitude was, we must keep the law as we always have. Now, they were not necessarily evil people and, and corrupt. There were, they were promonent, proponents of spirituality. There were many things that they were correct about. But Jesus says, as he brings in the kingdom, he's not doing away with the law that Pharisees are so loyal to, that scribes are so meticulous in recording. But he says he wants to talk about a righteousness that is more than they have achieved. 